Hey everybody, your friendly math tutor here with our last lecture video in this series. Today we do Unit 10, Infinite Sequences in Series, Part 2. So as always, like this video, subscribe to our channel, check out our TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook where we'll be posting videos like this. Check out Patreon where there's all kinds of worksheets and videos there. Um, and the test is really, really coming close. So if you're making it to this last video, uh, then that means you're really close to being done studying for this test and the test is right around the corner. So let's dive into our last set of topics. And so the last video, we, we looked at a lot of uh, infinite series and in determining whether how they converge or diverge. Now we take it even further and we go into Taylor series, Maclaurin series, power series, just in general. And um, we get started with things called Taylor polynomials. So a Taylor polynomial is going to be a way to use a polynomial to approximate other types of functions. Usually these like transcendental functions, sine, cosine, e to the x, or even some rational functions. So non-polynomials, can we can use polynomials to approximate them. And then what ends up happening, so basically a Taylor polynomial is where we do uh, kind of a set of things to create it, this polynomial. And then we stop it somewhere. And we're, like in this one, we're going to stop at degree three. Once we stop it, it becomes an approximation of that function. But if we do make it a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series where we continue it forever or just a power series in general, then at infinity, if we do an infinite number of terms, the polynomial is exactly equivalent to whatever function it was approximating at infinity. It's the same thing. So it's kind of this really, really cool concept. So let's just go over. We'll get started with just how you find a Taylor polynomial of a specific degree. So now this is going to be an approximation. All right, so we're going to use this formula. And we're going to start by just finding the first couple of derivatives. So we know f of x is ln x f prime of x is 1 over x, f double prime of x is, well, this is x to the negative 1, so it ends up just being uh, negative 1 x to the negative 2, so it's negative 1 over x squared. And finally, we should do the third derivative because we're going to degree 3. Uh, this is negative x to the negative 2, so we're going to get 2 x to the negative 3, which is 2 over x cubed. And then what we need for our approximation, so we're going to look at it like this. We're going to say ln of x is approximately, and it's going to be centered at 1. So we've got to find f of a, f prime of a, f double prime of a, and f triple prime of a. And a is what we call the center. So the center of this approximation is going to be at 1. So we're just going to substitute in 1. So if we plug... So let me do it like this. I'll just put like a little arrow. So if we substitute 1 into here, we're going to get 0. If we substitute 1 into here, we're going to get 1. If we substitute 1 into here, we're going to get negative 1. And if we substitute 1 into here, we're going to get 2. So we start our approximation with f of a. Well, f of a, plugging in 1 into our function, gave us 0. So we don't have a term here. I'm actually going to write it. I understand we don't need it, but just so you can see all the things that we're going to do, that could be a value that's not zero. So zero plus, now we got f prime of a. Well, f prime of a is one, so I'm going to write the one, and then it's x minus a. So it's going to be x minus one because we're centered at one. Then we keep going. f double prime of a, we got negative one, so that means I'm going to write minus one times x minus one squared over two factorial. And finally, I'll make way for, I'll rewrite that problem in a second. Um, finally, our last term is plus f triple prime of a, which is 2, times x minus 1 to the third over 3 factorial. And then we stop there. So this right here is what we would call the third degree Taylor polynomial. It's possible that you would uh, maybe just simplify this, but I'm going to leave it up here like this. Obviously, we don't need the zero. We don't need the one. We don't need the one. Two factorial is two, and three factorial is six, and the two over six could reduce. I'm just going to leave it like this just so we can see 
This is how you build what's called a Taylor polynomial centered at some A value. And we could keep going. If we wanted degree four, we would find the fourth derivative at one and we would multiply by X minus one to the fourth over four factorial. And we could just keep going. The more terms we do, the more accurate it would be. So the idea would be if I wanted to take, let's say the LN of 1.1, then I could just plug in 1.1 over here, and that'll give me a really good approximation. You'd be surprised at how good of an approximation it would be with only a couple of terms. And if I continued this out to infinity, it would exactly be the natural log of x. So all functions can be written as polynomials. They can be approximated by them, and then they can be exactly equal to them when we take that polynomial out to an infinite number of terms. All right, so now we take a look at these things called Maclaurin series. So all the Maclaurin series is, is it is a Taylor series. So the series part means it goes on forever as opposed to a polynomial which stops at some point. Um, and the Maclaurin part of it is anything that's, any Taylor series that's centered at zero. So a Maclaurin series is a Taylor series, just that's centered at zero. So they're used interchangeably a lot, but just understand when they tell you a Taylor series, they have to give you where it's centered at, like this set at one. A Maclaurin series does not have to tell you. So you should, it's really important that if you read something that asks for a Maclaurin series, just know that it, it's inherent to it that it's centered at zero, right? So that's super important. So common Maclaurin series is, uh, so for sine x, sine x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, and then so on. Cosine x is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, and so on. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over, oh, I skipped, I skipped one plus x to the third over three factorial plus uh, x to the fourth over four factorial and so on. So these three, and the same will go for this, but these three, all I'm doing is if I were to apply this formula and I found all the derivatives and all the values at zero and substitute it in, so again, where a was equal to zero, I would get these. And these become really, really common you should know these. I feel like I picked out the one, the four most important. Uh, this last one, even if you don't have it memorized, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out. This is the formula for the sum of an infinite geometric series, which we learned last class. So that means the first term is one. And then each time our common ratio is X. So each time we're just multiplying by X. So one times X is X, X times X is X squared, X squared times X is X cubed, and you get the pattern, and then it goes on and on and on. We could do this and get the same thing, but it's just easier to look at this as a geometric series. So there is, if you look in a lot of textbooks, you'll see maybe eight to 10 of these. You might see one over one plus X, uh, LN of X, or sometimes it's LN of X plus one or X minus one, uh, tan, inverse. Uh, so there's others. I find these to be the four most uh, kind of popular that show up on the AP test. And what you're expected to do with them, so the problem I erased was x e to the 2x. So let's say we have x e to the 2x. And we wanted to find the, the Maclaurin um, series associated with this function. We don't have to do all of this. All right, we don't have to find a bunch of derivatives of this because it would get complicated. There's power rule, there's chain rule, and then the second, third, fourth derivatives would just be a complete mess. So instead of doing that, anything that has an E, a sine, a cosine in it, or has like a rational function like this, you want to build the, the series from one of these. So we're going to start with E to the X, and we're actually going to from that find E to the 2X. 
So the way e to the x is e to the two x is related to e to the x is a composite function. We're just substituting x for two x. So then we just do that here. So we get one plus this x becomes two x. Then we have two x squared over two factorial, and I'll just do one more. Then we have two x cubed over three factorial, and then it just goes on from there. So that's how we can find e to the two x from e to the x. And then if we wanna find x times that, we literally just do algebra. We just multiply each side of the equation by x. So we get x e to the two x equals, so this times x is x plus two x times x is two x squared. Now we can do a little bit of simplifying. This is four x squared times x is gonna be four x cubed over two factorial. And then we get eight x cubed, which becomes eight x to the fourth when we multiply by x over three factorial plus, and then we just go on and on from there. So that's how we can build a Maclaurin. These are, so these are the common ones. If you had to find some, then with sign, with things like the sign of something and a time something, you just build it using algebra. You start with this as your base, you do the composite part first, then you do some whatever, it's multiplying, sometimes you might add to both sides, but you could just do manipulation to get the Maclaurin series. Okay, let's keep going. All right, let's keep it moving and take a look at something called a Lagrange error bound. So basically what happens is when you use a Taylor polynomial to approximate some other function, it's when you, uh, when you use the polynomial and you don't take the series out to infinity and you just use say three, four, five terms, which is common, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, there's gonna be an error. You're gonna be off by some amount. So if you have say like e to the x, when you do e to a value, and then you use say the first four terms of the Taylor polynomial, when you plug it in, they're gonna be close to each other, but there's still gonna be this gap between the approximation and the exact value. So the exact value is f of x, and if you take away the Taylor polynomial at, at some degree n, you're gonna get, again, this gap. And when you subtract them and take the absolute value, that's gonna be what we call the remainder, all right? That's, that's your gap from your approximation to the actual answer. And what Lagrange's error bound says, again, it, there's a proof of this and it's a little bit more complicated, but, but for the AP test, if right now this is how you could see it, is the remainder is always less than or equal to capital M, which I'll talk about in a second, and then it's just x minus the center raised to the n plus one. So if we take this, say, degree three, then we're going to raise it to the fourth power and divide by four factorial. Now, what capital N is, capital M, you want to make an integer, typically, that is bigger than that. So again, if let's for our example, let's say we're talking about degree three. So we would want to find the fourth derivative of our function and pick a value that's bigger than that fourth derivative on the interval, either x to a or a to x, depending on if a is bigger or smaller than the x that we're approximating. All right, so that might not make any sense at all, what I just said, so let me just do an example of how to come up with the third degree polynomial and then how we use this error bound. All right, the key is gonna be finding m, uh, there's a couple different ways to find M. Many times, they, I really know of like three ways how you would have to find M, uh, and I'll talk about that when we do this problem. So the first part is to review what we did uh, in, in the early part of this video, is find a third-degree Taylor polynomial. So a third-degree Taylor polynomial is at zero is going to be F of zero plus F prime of zero times X because uh, it's really x minus zero, uh, plus f double prime of zero times x, I don't know why I put that parentheses, x squared over two factorial, and then finally f triple prime of zero times x cubed over three factorial. So that's just in general what we do, and then here, instead of giving us the function, they just told us all the information that we needed. So f prime of zero is one, or sorry, f of zero is one, f prime of zero is a half, so I get plus one half x. And then f double prime of zero is negative one fourth. So I'm gonna have minus one fourth, but that four gets multiplied by this two, so it's gonna be one eighth x squared. 
And finally, we get um, F triple prime of zeros, three eighths. So that eight is going to get multiplied by six. So it's going to be three over 48. I will fix that in a second. And then that three over 48. So again, the three eights and then the eight got multiplied by six because that's three factorial. Three forty eights is one sixteen. So that is our third degree. We stop at X cubed. That's our third degree Taylor polynomial with this given information on zero to one centered at zero. Now, what is the error bound? So the error bound is just, well, what happens when I substitute in 0.5 and I subtract, uh, uh, let's actually do this appropriately, let's call this T3 of X because the third degree Taylor polynomial. And if I subtract T3 of 0 0.5, what's the error bound for that, all right? That's our goal is, if I plug 0.5 into this function that, that I don't even know, that'll give me some actual value of, of f of 0.5. If I plug 0.5 into our Taylor polynomial, that'll give me an approximation of that value. That approximation is off. There is a little bit of a gap between those. Well, this is saying what's the most that that gap can be? And that's this formula here. So m, I'm going to leave a space for m. And I'm just going to do the other part because you can always do that first because it's so easy. It's x minus a. Well, the center here is zero. So that's just x to the n plus one. Three plus one is four. So that's x to the fourth. But x in this case is 0 0.5. So I get 0 0.5 to the fourth. And then it's always over that factorial. So it'll be over four factorial. Now for n. I, I think I've seen three different ways for them to give you n. One of them is directly just like this one. They're just telling us that the fourth derivative of this function is always less than or equal to six. That's basically just saying u six. Another way I've seen it is they'll give you a graph of that derivative and then you just look in between. So in this case, we'd be on the interval zero to 0 0.5. So the center, sorry, the center to the value of x that we're approximating and you would look at the graph and look for the highest point. And the other way is if they just, if you have that derivative, uh, typically it's a function that's either increasing or decreasing the whole time. And then you just plug in the endpoints and you take the larger of those values. It could get more complicated than that, but I, I don't, I rarely have ever seen that. So I feel like the most likely option is they'll either give it to you directly what to use for M, or they'll give you the graph of that derivative and you'll be able to look at the highest value on the given interval. Uh, and then we could do this real quick. I have a calculator here. So all you would do is just basically substitute this in. So it's 0.5 to the fourth times six divided by uh, 24 and we get 0 0.0156. So that would just mean that the most amount that this approximation would be off would be by, you know, 0 0.0156. All right. So let's, uh, let's keep it moving and move on to power series. All right, let's move on to power series. So what exactly is a power series? Well, Taylor series and a Maclaurin series are types of power series. So power series is almost like an infinity within another infinity. So you first learned about sequences, which is just a list of numbers. And then you take that list of numbers and you start adding them together. And that becomes a series. And you can make that an infinite series. So you could do, you know, one plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth. And you could add that forever. That's called an infinite series. And that infinite series sometimes converges to a value. It has like a wall. And other times it just grows without bound. Now, a power series takes a series like that and it throws in a power function. A power function is just essentially x to a power. So this is an example of a power series. You have n's and you have x's. So now you have added this idea of infinity within infinity. So you have an infinite series of numbers. And then x could take on an infinite number of values. If I make x a certain value, 
that will give me an infinite series. I can make x another value, and it'll give me a different infinite series, and I can make x another value. So I have infinity going this way. It goes on forever that way. And then if I make x number of values, it's an infinity that goes on this way. So it's just infinitely long and then infinitely deep as far as if you think of it that way, all the values of x. Now within all those values of x, so again, it goes on forever going that way, the series, each individual series. And then for each individual value of x, some of those values of x are going to create a series that converges, and some of those values of x are going to create a series that diverge. The intervals of x's where they converge is called the interval of convergence. And then from its center, we talked about center with Taylor and McLaurin. McLaurin is always centered at zero. Taylor's could be, you know, centered anywhere. Wherever its center is, however far it is on either end to its edge of its interval convergence is called its radius of convergence. So let's really go over how to find radius of convergence and interval of convergence. If we want to know where this, for what values of x would this series converge, we want to use the, usually, you want to use the ratio test. So we are going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n, which is multiplying by the reciprocal of this. And if you remember the ratio test, whenever that limit was less than 1, we got a value that converged. So I'm going to make this less than 1. So every x value that satisfies this limit means that when I do the ratio test for that x value, I will get a series that converges. And any other x value must be a series that diverges. So now we just do a little bit of algebra. So I got this n over n plus 1. Notice the, n, the n's are definitely positive, so I don't need the absolute value for those. And then I got 2 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n. Well, that n plus 1 minus n is 1, so 2 to the first is 2. So I can bring that out, and I can actually put it there. Then what I have is still under the absolute value is the x's. The x's could be negative. Uh, so I do need the absolute value around those, and x to the uh, x minus one to the n plus one. So again, you subtract, you just get to the first power. So I'm just going to get x minus one. I need that to be less than one. Then you evaluate this limit. This limit is only based off of n values. So I don't need to worry about the x. I just need to evaluate this limit. We should see that this limit is two. This right here is what we call capital R. That's our radius of convergence, all right? So first notice that this one is our A value. That's our center. And this is saying that the distance from one is less than a half. So if you just remember absolute value. Um, so that means that one half is our radius of convergence. What's happening is, so if you essentially, if you start at, if you start at one and you go one half in each direction, that puts you from one half to three halves. So again, center at one, radius one half, add a half, subtract a half from one, and you get this. This is our interval of convergence. But are we including them or not? Am I using parentheses or brackets? This is where we have to go back to our original. So let's just say x equals 1 half. I substitute 1 half in for this. Um, 1 half minus 1 is negative half, and negative half times 2 is negative 1. So I get negative 1 to the n over n, and then it's the summation of that. Well, this is the alternating harmonic series. We should know from a couple videos ago, or probably just the last video, um, the alternating harmonic series by the alternating series test is definitely convergent. So it converges here, so I'm going to include that one. Then I'm going to do x equals 3 halves. 
So if I plug in three halves, three halves minus one is uh, one half. One half times two is one, and one to the n, one to anything is just one. So in this case, I get one over n. Well, this is the harmonic series, or a p series where p is equal to one. We should know again from the last video that that is definitely a diverging series. So I put a parenthesis because I'm not going to include that. So this is saying, again, imagine this idea that I've got a, a, a single series for a single value of x that goes on forever. But then every value of x, that happens. So now it goes on forever this way for every value of x that I make it. And then any value of x that I make between 1 half, including it, and 3 halves, not including it, that's going to create an infinite series that converges to a specific value. And every other value, anything less than a half or bigger, 3 halves or bigger, it's going to create diverging series. So that's what the radius of convergence is and the interval of convergence. All right, let's take a look at one more example. Pretty much with these, you can just expect to do the ratio test. So we're going to start with the limit as, uh, not x, as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial absolute value times the reciprocal of this because it's a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n. So that means I'm multiplying by the reciprocal. So I get n factorial over x to the n and that is less than 1. So by the ratio test, I need to find the values of x such that this is less than 1, and those values of x will make each, each of its series converge. Uh, I like to do the n's first. So this is n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. Well, n plus 1 factorial is really n plus 1 times n factorial, and then they cancel out. So I'm left with 1 over n plus 1. Then I'm going to have the absolute value. n plus 1 minus n is 1, so I have x to the first. Now here's something interesting that happens. I'm going to do this limit. So the n's can come out of the absolute value because they're guaranteed to be positive. The x's stay in the absolute value. Evaluate the limit of the n's. Get a number, usually divide by that number and you will get your radius of convergence, then use that radius or solve the absolute value inequality to get your interval of convergence, and then test your endpoints. But in this one, something interesting happens. This limit is zero. I can't divide by zero. So it means I'm pretty much done. I just want you to think about what happens here. This means that no matter what value of x I choose, I, when I multiply by this limit, this limit will always exist because the n's aren't going to change. Your chain, the x's are what are going to be different. I'm going to get zero, and zero is always less than one. So that means every single value of x will converge. So its radius of convergence is considered infinity, and its interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity, so I don't have to test the endpoints. Um, so every single value of x is going to converge because we get this limit to be zero. All right, let's take a look at a couple more examples and that'll be the end of our video. All right, let's move on. We are gonna do three problems to kind of tie this all together. So here we've got a function cosine of two x plus pi over six centered at zero. We wanna find the third degree um, polynomial. And let me just check something really quickly. I'm going to change this. This should be that. Okay. All right. So to find the third degree polynomial, one way we could do this is we could find all the derivatives. So the derivative of this is negative sine but then the derivative of this is 2, so it's going to be negative 2 sine of 2x plus pi over 6. And then the second derivative of x is going to be, the derivative of sine is cosine, I'm going to multiply by another 2, so it's going to be negative 4 cosine 2x plus pi over 6. 
And finally, I want to find the third derivative, which is um, positive 8 sine of 2x plus pi over 6. And now if I build the polynomial, the first thing I do is I plug in f of 0. Well, f of 0 is the cosine of pi over 6, which is root 3 over 2. And then I jump to f prime of x. So the next thing is f prime of 0. Well, f prime of 0 is going to be the sine of pi over 6, which is a half, times negative 2 is negative 1. So I'm going to have minus 1, and then we're going to have x to the first, and that's it. Then I jump down here. I plug in 0 to this. So this is the cosine of pi over 6, which, again, is root 3 over 2 times negative 4. So that's negative 2 root 3 times x squared over 2. So I essentially could cancel those. And then finally, for the third degree, I'm going to plug in 0 to this. Sine of pi over 6 is a half. A half times 8 is 4. So it's going to be plus 4 um, x cubed over 3 factorial, which is 6. I could make this 2 thirds. So my final answer, if we simplify this, is root 3 over 2 minus x minus root 3x squared plus 2x cubed over 3. That is our third degree Taylor polynomial. All right, now let's take a look at part B. So part B, we have to prove that the difference between these, so the error bound, is um, less than 1 over 12,000. So what happens is this um, right here, unfortunately, is not alternating. So we can't use the alternating series error bound, which is a little easier. We're going to have to use the Lagrange error bound. So we got to find the next derivative. So the fourth derivative of this is going to be 2 times 8, so 16 cosine of 2x plus pi over 6. And then what we can do is, so we know that this error bound is going to be less than or equal to capital N. Well, capital M is the largest value that this can take on. Uh, we could get more granular and look at what's happening between 0 and 1 tenth, but it's just easy enough when you have a trig function. The largest that cosine can be is 1, so we're just going to make, we're going to say the largest that the fourth derivative can be is 16, just to pick a nice easy integer. So we get 16. And then we have x, which x is actually uh, one tenth to the fourth power over four factorial, which is 24. So now we figure out what that is. And that's. 6.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. And what happens is 1 divided by 12,000 is 8.3 times 10 to the negative fifth. So we have now gotten our error bound. So this is less than this. So we have proven that the max value of our error is less than 1 over 12,000. So that proves what we were trying to prove. Okay, let's move on to number two. We have a series here, a power series, so we're going to do the ratio test. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1, so that's um, 2 times n plus 1, so that's 2n plus 2 factorial times x minus 5 to the n plus 1, over 2n factorial times x minus 5 to the n. And we need all that to be less than 1. And then what we do is we just continue with this. So the limit as n goes to infinity. So 2n plus 2 factorial is really 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times 2n factorial. And the factorials cancel. So we get 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1. Times the absolute value of, well, this is just x minus 5. We need it to be less than 1. But what happens is this limit 
goes to infinity. So here we have the opposite of what happened before. So we have infinity times anything is going to be infinity, and then it's never going to be less than one, except for at one value. So the only value that this is going to be, so the, the interval of convergence, there really is none, and there is no radius. It's going to converge at x equals 5. So all power series converge at their center, because if you plug in the center, you're going to get 0, and then you have a bunch of zeros being added together, and that clearly will converge to 0. So it converges all, they always converge at its center, but its radius of convergence is simply just zero. So when that happens, when we get in, an infinite limit here, then all we have is its radius of convergence is zero, and then it only converges at its center. There basically is no interval and there is no radius. Okay? All right, and our last problem, find the coefficient of x to the sixth in f of x equals sine of x squared. So for this one, I would just use the already known uh, power series, or sorry, Maclaurin series for sine. So I'm going to get sine of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. I'm going to stop there. I'm actually going to make this approximately equal to. I am going to stop there because um, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to just substitute in x squared, and I just want to get to a, at least degree 6, but you'll see what happens when I substitute in x squared. So then sine of x squared is going to be, when I replace this with x squared, I'm going to have x squared here. Now x squared to the third, that's where x to the sixth comes from, and 3 factorial is, oops, is 6. Uh, and finally, plus, this will be x to the 10th over 5 factorial, which is 120. Um, so sine of x squared is approximately equal to this. And in the Maclaurin series, and I guess technically if it's a series, I could use equals and put like a dot, dot, dot. But x to the 6th, the coefficient of that is just going to be negative 1 sixth. All right. So that concludes all of our lecture videos. As always, check out our Patreon. We've got other videos and worksheets on there. Uh, check out the TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll be putting more videos up there. And good luck to all of you that are taking the AP test. And I hope this was helpful. All right, bye.